title of our lesson this evening, You Can Dig It, is not from the 1950 beadneck movement. Now, some of you young kids have to Google what that means. Or the TV show, The Many Loves of Gilda Gillis, which ran from 1953 to 1963, in which Bob Denver, who uh, later became famous through Gilligan's Island, he played the beatnik called Maynard G. Cripps. But Can You Dig It comes from archaeology, the digging up of something ancient. Now, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 begins, All scripture is inspired of God. So the Greek word there for inspired means God breathed. The Bible came from God, and I believe that with all my heart. Yet most of humanity does not. Evidences of inspiration may be, may be divided in two categories, internal and external evidence. While some evidence are found between the covers of the Bible itself, others are found outside the Bible. Remember that when God designed the Bible, he planned it to speak for itself. Yet, it is interesting to consider evidence of an external nature. Though these are not essential, they are very supportive and encouraging for those who follow God's word. They help give our faith that extra boost as we see these external evidence support the accuracy and the authenticity of the Bible. The general scientific field of study that discovers this external evidence is called archaeology in general and biblical archaeology in particular. So what is archaeology? We can define it the scientific study of the material remains of past human life and activity. What then is biblical archaeology? This may be defined as a study based on the excavation and critical evolution of the records of the past as they relate to or affect the Bible. While the general field of archaeology is fascinating, much more so is the study of biblical archaeology since it deals with the Holy Scriptures. The attraction lies in the supreme importance of the message and meaning of the Bible. I want you to listen to these statements from renowned archaeologists. Here's what they say. It may be stated chronologically that no archaeology discovery has ever controverted a Bible reference. Scores of archaeology finds, findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or exact detail historical statements in the Bible. And by the same token, proper evaluation of biblical descriptions have often led to amazing discoveries. Another one says, archaeology has confirmed countless passages which have been rejected by critics as unhistorical or contradictory in known facts. There can be no doubt that archaeology has confirmed the historicity of Old Testament tradition. The great value of archaeology has been to show over and over again that the geography, technological, political, and military movements, the cultures, religious practices, social institutions, languages, customs, and other aspects of everyday life of Israel and other nations of antiquity were exactly as described in the Bible. Biblical archaeology spans what we know as the ancient biblical world, any and all countries where biblical events and biblical history have occurred. All finds are important. The major finds generally make the news where the lesser ones are, are discoveries just seem to do not make the news. In addition to Israel, other important biblical sites include Italy, Greece, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, 
Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. Of course, there are many sites in Israel. There are 300 known sites, with only 50 of the 300 having been uh, excavated or are in the process of being unearthed. Underwater archaeology along the sea line or sea coast of Israel. You've got the harbors of Caesarea as well as Ascalon are under water or being uh, surveyed and checked out. It wasn't really until the beginning of the 19th century, up until that time, very little was known of biblical times and biblical backgrounds, except what appeared in the Old Testament or was preserved in the writings of classical antiquity. Modern archaeology may have had its beginning in 1798 when the rich antiquities of the Nile River Valley were opened up to scientific study by Napoleon's Egyptian expedition. And the last 50 plus years have witnessed the birth, growth, and the phenomenon development of the science of biblical archaeology because by the mid-1800s, many in the country of England began to doubt the Bible record. So the search was on to show that the Bible is of God. Not so much from biblical archaeology, but as from history, comes a very interesting story that was recorded by Werner Keller, uh, Keller in his book, The Bible as History. <clears throat> it talks about a British Army major named Vivian Gilbert. He tells this remarkable occurrence <clears throat> that in World War I, as a major in Allen B's army in Palestine, they was, he was searching for a particular name in the Bible. His brigade had received orders to take a village that stood on a rocky area on the other side of a deep valley. Now it was called Mishmash. Now he knew about it and he knew it was from the Bible, so he decided to try to look for it. Eventually, he found it in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 14. Now the Philistines had camped in Mishmash and Saul's army was outnumbered and in a state of fear to fight against the Philistines. So Saul's son, Jonathan, and his armor bearer, they crossed over to the Philistine side where there was a sharp cliff on one side and another sharp cliff on the other. One of these bluffs was on the north opposite of Mishmash and the other on the south opposite of a town called Geba. So these two Israelites, they attacked, causing the Philistines to think that they were surrounded by all of Saul's troops. And uh, 1 Samuel 14, verse 14 says that they melted away and went here and there. So the Philistines were in a state of confusion, so Saul attacks and wins the victory. So this brigade major, a major, he knows this narrow pass must still be there, it didn't matter how many centuries later. So he woke up the command, and they read this passage together. So patrols were sent out, and they find the pass, which was very thinly held by the Turks. So the general ordered his, he altered his plan of attack by sending one camp, a company through this pass under cover of darkness. They overpower these few Turks without a sound. They scale the cliffs and they take or took the position. The Turks woke up and in disorder thought that they were surrounded by Allen B's army. They were either then killed or taken prisoner. So the, concluded, the conclusion of this Major Gilbert says, after thousands of years, British troops successfully copied the tactics of Saul and Jonathan. So what this is, it's not archaeology, but it's geography. It happened there's a place this was described in a battle centuries, centuries before. So the present day people, during World War I, look for it, they find it, and they duplicate it. So that's part of this concept of the Bible is in harmony with reality. 
But now let's examine a few great archaeology discoveries that have been preserved in national museums. The first one is the Rosetta Stone. It was a decree issued by the priest of Memphis in honor of one of their pharaohs called Potomi, verse, he was number five, a pharaoh. Now this stone is approximately feet, uh, three feet high and two feet and four inches wide and it gets its name from an Egyptian town called Rosetta that was nearby when this thing was discovered in 1798 by an officer in Napoleon's expedition in Egypt where these French soldiers were digging in order to build a fort there in Egypt. Now its significance is not so much in its contents. However, its value is in that it was able to open up the secrets of hieroglyphic writings to the world of scholarship. Because the inscriptions on this rock were in Greek and two forms of ancient Egyptian. Now the Greek could at once be read and it provided the clue to decipher the other two Egyptian languages. Now once these Egyptian code was broken, the great field of the uh, Egyptology was born. This was the key that unlocked the door of knowledge of the language and the literature of ancient Egypt. So once they could do that, they could then see how ancient Egypt was talking about Israel through its history and they were able to understand. So there is a tremendous background of information that was discovered of the Bible in through Egypt on the stone. That stone is now in the British Museum after the defeat of the, the, Napoleon and his army. The second stone is called the Moabite stone. In 1868 it was found in a town in, called uh, Dibon in present Jordan, uh, just north of ancient Moab. Now this inscribed slab was three feet ten inches in height, two feet wide, and ten and a half inches thick. Now since the German and French officials attempted to gain possession of this stone, sensing that they had an object of value, the Arabs built a fire under the stone and then they poured water over it to break it up into pieces. The fragments were then carried away to bless their grain. The position of these Muslims wasn't any different from Catholicism and its idols, as they were thinking that a magic charm was in this stone. Now you may not know this, but these ancient statues that were all around the Mediterranean Sea when the Muslims, or better known as the Moors at that time, invaded, they broke the faces or removed the heads of these statues because they referred to them as idols, which they despised. Which is silly, but that was just their way of thinking. That's why you see all these headless statues of antiquity in Greece and everything else. But you know, you've got some foolish Americans today behaving like these ignorant Muslims. We're doing what best things with our statues. Well, anyways, back to the story. Western authorities, they recovered most or much of the scattered fragments. And uh, it was about two-thirds of the text. As a matter of fact, it was 669 letters out of an estimate of 1,110. The stone was reconstructed and placed in the French Louvre. Anyways, it contains the importance of this stone, it contains 39 lines of writing in Moabite language, which is closely akin to the Hebrew biblical language. Now this is the longest single extra biblical literary inscription dealing with Palestine in the period of 900 to 600 BC. This stone tells of Omri, who is the king of Israel, and his son Ahab, who was a successor in 1 Kings 16, verse 16. It also talks about the worship of the Moabite, Moabite god Kishmash, which was associated with the high places that was denounced by the Israelite prophets. So that was the second thing, Moabite stone. The third object we want to talk about is the black abacus. Uh, this was discovered in the palace of Nimrod in 1846. It's a four-sided stone pillar 
of black marble, six feet five inches uh, in height, and it tapers to the top like the uh, pyramids, or maybe basically it looks like a Washington monument, but much smaller version. Now it records the campaigns of Salmazur the third, king of eight, uh, it, uh, the Assyrians in 858 to 824 BC. And it pictures the conquered kings bringing their tribute to him. Among those in the second row is Jehu, who reigned over Israel in Samaria for 28 years. This is found in 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 36. One writer says, Reading the Black Obelisk is almost like reading from the book of the Kings and the book of Chronicles. So you have that one. And our fourth topic, or fourth one we want to look at, is the prism of Sinusara, uh, which is one of many examples of written records from the great empires with whom the Israelites had contact. This clay prism contains the annals of the Assyrian king, including the account of his attack on Jerusalem in 701 BC during the time of King Hezekiah, and this is recorded in 2 Kings 18, verse 13 to 16. So you have these four uh, living proof, these eyewitnesses outside of the Bible, secular history that confirm Bible. So that's amazing when we think about it. You know, we could also this evening talk about the bricks without straw and stubble. We could talk about the El, uh, the Tel El Armion tablets, the Abel top, the Abel tablets, or the Lachish letters, but you're just going to have to go home and, and Google those. But these are just a few from things of the Old Testament that are now in different museums all over the world. But there's also many things also in the New Testament that reconfirm the Bible. All the biblical finds of the past combine to speak as one voice from the distant past, testifying to the inspiration and the accuracy of the Bible. Nothing has ever been discovered to contradict or go against the book of all books. It just reinforces what we have always believed, that the Bible is the literal Word of God. Now rest assured that the thrilling story of biblical archaeology is yet not completed, and many will continue to be in doubt, even though we know the Bible is of God. Great discoveries yet remain, and God will bring them to light when he says it's time. For example, it won't be long everybody was saying there never was a Noah, never was an ark, and before you know it, bingo. We, archaeologists will actually discover there is an ark. We must only wait to see what the next archae great archaeologist spade will turn up having been buried for centuries. So the question basically is, can you dig it? which is what, what we're talking about. But there is enough evidence now to put our faith in the God of the Bible. So the question for you is this evening, will you not obey this God? Will you do as he tells us that we need to do through belief, repentance, and water remission for the forgiveness of your sins? And then as was said this morning, then live faithfully unto death. So if you need to respond to his invitation, do that right now and come as together we stand.